Hello and welcome. Thanks for coming to visit us today. My name is Nick. I'm the program manager of our site, but more importantly, I'm going to be your guide to our grounds today. So let's just start off with a quick timeline of our site's history, get you familiar. I'm sure some of you have visited before, but I've always found a refresher course, never hurt anybody. Our site story begins over a hundred years ago in 1905. We have an event known as the Storm of the Century, the Matapa Blow, that sweeps through the North Shore, sinking and running aground 29 ships in its wake. Now at the time, Duluth is outpacing both New York and London in the shipping of iron ore, so this storm really ends up being the straw that breaks the camel's back in terms of getting funding to build a site up here. In 1907, $75,000 is secured to build our site up here. Construction begins in 1909 and is completed the following year, with us lighting our beacon for the first time, July 31st, 1910. Now the site itself was originally operated by a group known as the United States Lighthouse Service. They're an offshoot of the Department of Commerce. They run our site from 1910 until 1939, at which point they're absorbed by the United States Coast Guard. The Coast Guard then runs our site for an additional 30 years, bringing us to 1969, the year our site is decommissioned. Now, as for why we're decommissioned, Simply put, advances in technology rendered our lighthouse obsolete. You've got radar, ship-to-shore communications, GPS nowadays, of course. Simply put, we weren't as important as we used to be. So, come 1969, our site is given to the state of Minnesota for preservation. The grounds do reopen in 71 as part of the state park system. And finally, come 1976, the Minnesota Historical Society assumes stewardship of the site. And we're the ones who are responsible for the grounds ever since. We are in charge of the restoration of our historic buildings, as well as the interpretation that takes place on our site. Now, if you'll follow me, we'll make our way down to our hoist and derrick site, and then onto the light station grounds. All right, welcome everybody. I mentioned a welcome earlier to the site, but this is the perfect location to give you a warm welcome to Minnesota's North Shore. Since right behind us over there, you have the beautiful Lake Superior, largest lake in the world by surface area, third deepest, absolutely incredible with three quadrillion gallons of water. This is also my favorite location to give a bit more information about that storm of the century I mentioned earlier. The storm itself, occurs November 27th through the 28th of the year 1905. You have 27 ships that sink or run aground during this storm, including the Madeira, the closest shipwreck to our site. Just behind me, you can make out Gold Rock Point there. The Madeira actually ends up running up against those rocks there, breaking into two and sinking during the storm. The storm itself boasting 60 mile an hour winds, a negative 50 degree wind chill, less than a quarter mile visibility, and last but not least, 30 foot tall waves. Little wonder you have so many ships that sink or run aground during this storm. The crew of the Madeira is incredibly fortunate though. Nine of the 10 men aboard survive, thanks to the quick thinking of one of the sailors, a Fred Benson, who actually manages to grab a rope and leap onto the cliffside. He manages to climb up that 60 foot tall cliff, tie off his rope, lower to rescue eight of his remaining crew members, all while in the midst of the storm. They're rescued by the Edna G in the coming days, and the final crew member is raised from the depths as well. Now, while we're down here too, I just want to give a quick mention to our Hoist and Derrick site. You can only see the foundational remain of it at this point, but this is where we initially are getting supplies brought up onto the site. This would have consisted of a swivel-based arm and a hoisting engine. The arm itself being able to go out over the lake, allowing you to lower a crate down the side of the cliff. That crate could then be filled with supplies by incoming boats, it would then be raised up onto the site again. In the six years that this is active, from 1909 until 1915, you have about 325 tons of equipment that are brought up, mainly building materials, in addition to the other necessities that are needed to make our site run like the well-oiled machine that it is. Come 1916, however, we transition to using a tramway system to supply our site. Think of it as a 
the beginning of a roller coaster is how I like to put it. You have a length of track that runs from the shoreline going up, pulling a cart via the use of an engine spooling cable. This is used all the way until 1934. At that point, North Shore Highway 61 is completed and we have automobiles supplying our site from then on. The rest, well, history. Now we'll make our way up to the light station grounds. I'll give you a little bit of information about our buildings as well. All right, here we are on our light station grounds. All of the buildings that you can see up here are originals. We haven't moved them an inch from their original locations. And for having eight of the nine, I think that's a pretty good track record for over 110 years of service. So the first buildings completed on our site are the storage barns that you can see over to the right there. We have two of the three. They're the first buildings completed, as I mentioned used to keep equipment under lock and key during the construction period, as well as providing housing for the timekeeper, the quartermaster, and the engineer on our site. Once the keepers are living here, they're using those buildings to keep their additional supplies, coal and such, safely tucked away, and eventually they're converted into garages for automobiles once the 1930s roll around and we have road access to the site. Next completed, the homes themselves. Three of them, one for each of the keepers on our site. The home closest to us here is our head keepers, followed by his first and then second assistant down the line. All three of these houses are identical, even down to the paint colors on the walls. They would have been exactly the same. It's a lot easier to build the same thing three times than try to make any difference in rank or anything like that. And quite honestly, these houses are very comfortable for the time period, boasting indoor plumbing, radiated steam heat, and running water. That being said, it is a little bit of a challenge to get that running water up here. The water itself actually pumped up from Lake Superior itself to our fog signal building, and then gravity fed back down to the homes, all through a series of above ground external pipes. You may be thinking that's a little bit of a problem here on the North Shore, and you are entirely right to think so. It gets very cold up here, and those pipes, if they weren't being drained, run the risk of freezing or bursting. So you may be thinking, what did the keepers and their families do when the weather did get cold? Well, the homes were designed with another method of collecting water. If you take a look at our roof, you'll notice that we have a downspout that doesn't go onto the lawn, but into the basement. That connects to a thousand gallon holding cistern. So our keepers are collecting rainwater, storing it in their basement, and that connects to a hand pump in the kitchen so they at least have some liquid water in the homes year round. Now, the last building on this lower portion of the site is our oil house. It's kind of tucked away from the other buildings on our site, kind of plain in comparison to, but don't let its appearance deceive you. It served an absolutely vital purpose on the site. See, this is where we're storing all of the kerosene and gasoline that we're using on site. Our lighthouse and fog signal building both use those fuels about two and a half gallons of kerosene a day for our lighthouse's lamp, or a night, I suppose I should say. In addition to that, our gasoline engines burned about four gallons of gas an hour in the fog signal building. Our site was resupplied every six to eight weeks, meaning that we needed to store both of those fuels in bulk quantities, both of which are very combustible and very dangerous. So we needed to make sure we had a strong, secure building to protect them and the families. Enter our oil house, 16 inch thick reinforced concrete walls and a half inch thick plate steel door. The thoughts behind this being, well, if all of that fuel inside is to go up in one big explosion, the building will take the brunt of the blow, protecting the families as well as the workstations themselves. Now, in 1940, our stations electrified. We switched to using an electric bulb and an electric motor inside our fog signal building. So thankfully, we never had an opportunity to test how thoroughly that oil house was built. Now, the moment that you've all been waiting for, our workstations themselves, we've got the lighthouse itself and our fog signal building. I'll start us off with the reason that you all wanna come here, of course. Split Rock Lighthouse measures in at 54 feet tall. We're not exactly the tallest lighthouse in the United States, but we do sit atop a 130 foot tall cliff at that elevation, meaning mother nature's doing most of the hard work for us. 
Now, inside our lighthouse, we still have several of the original methods of operation. We still hand wind the weights every two hours to keep that lens rotating. It floats on a bed of mercury that displaces the weight of the lens assembly. We are the only active mercury float in the United States to our knowledge. In addition to that, we still have our original lens up there as well. That is a third order Fresnel bivalve lens. I realize that's a lot of confusing jargon there, so I'll break that down a little bit. Orders of lenses refer to sizes. In the United States, the largest order is a first order, and the smallest is a sixth. So our third order lens is kind of middle of the road there. In addition to that, we are a Fresnel lens. That means that our lens up there isn't just one solid piece of glass. Instead, we are made up of over 250 separate banded prisms. These prisms bend and focus, or reflect and refract the light, basically giving you a more concentrated, intense beam. Thanks to those Fresnel prisms, our beacon can be seen for up to 22 miles away from our station here, during a clear night. Now, during the evening hours, you would be looking for that beacon. It has a unique flashing pattern, one flash of white light every 10 seconds. All lighthouses on Lake Superior have a different color and or flashing pattern to make them more identifiable. So, if you were seeing that flash of white light every 10 seconds, you would know that you were within 22 miles of Split Rock Lighthouse. Now, during the day, the beacons aren't active. Instead, you'd actually be looking at the physical appearance of a station for landmark navigation, as it's called. In our case, these day marks are the octagonal shape, the yellow brick, and the black top of our tower. They really help us stand out, make us unique, and very iconic as well, too. So night or day, we are a very effective navigational aid for landmarks and nighttime navigation. This is all provided you can actually see our station, however. And here on the North Shore, we get a fair bit of fog as well as other bad weather conditions. Downpours, blizzards, even smoke from wildfires can severely hamper your visibility. When you can't see all that far, you do have one last trick up your sleeves, though, to make sure that boats know where they're going. Enter our fog signal building, the final location on our site arguably the most important as well. Originally, we housed two 22 horsepower gasoline engines, one of which would be running around the clock during times of bad weather, building up pressure inside two air compressors, which in turn would then blast that air through two lakeside facing rooftop mounted sirens. These sirens have a unique pattern, a two second burst of sound, followed by 18 seconds of silence. So three times a minute they're going off with an effective range of five to seven miles. These horns are the equivalent of 120 decibels as well. That's putting you right on par with rock concert speakers, jackhammers, jet engines on takeoff. Enough to shake that entire building while it's active. We actually have wire pressed into the glass up there to make sure the windows didn't break from rattling back and forth. It's that intense of a sound. Now luckily our keepers are on the opposite side of those horns, making that they could sleep a little bit easier up here. But I'm pretty sure after those going for 12 days straight, everybody would be ready for a nice little vacation away from the site. That concludes our exploration of the grounds here. Thank you so much for taking the time to, uh, well, just enjoy a little bit of our gorgeous North Shore with me. Have a great day, everybody. Now, this is a pretty special tree. We don't let people up here too often, but figured if you're gonna be paying attention to me for this long, you deserve to see something real special. Now, next to me here, this is our lighthouse lens. It's not just any lens, it is our original lens. This was built for our site specifically. You've got 252 pieces of glass that make up our lens. It was imported from Paris, France, and assembled piece by piece on the site here. Now, you may notice it's a little bit different from what you may have been expecting. I know some people, when they come to our site, they're just expecting one big piece of glass, which admittedly would do a decent job of bending and focusing that light like a prism. But the thing is, if you were to use just one piece of glass, you can imagine shipping that across the ocean to here. It would probably break along the way. Even getting it from Lake Superior, 168 feet below us, up to here, it would probably end up getting a few cracks on the way, and if that lens cracks, 
It's essentially worthless. Plus, with a lens like this, a Fresnel lens it's called, you have a series of prisms. So you notice that they actually have that triangular prism shape, they're bent. Inside, the light bulb isn't actually all that big. Back in the day, originally, they used massive bonfires or braziers to make your light. But since 1940, when our station was electrified, we may do with a thousand watt light bulb. The bulb itself, and yeah, probably, let's say a foot long tops. But thanks to all these prisms, they capture the emitted light, bend it, focus it into the center bullseye here, which means that you have much greater intensity to that. It reflects and refracts, if I'm being technical, basically giving you a more intense, brilliant beam. Thanks to these Fresnel prisms, our beacon can be seen for 22 miles across Lake Superior. Certainly the highlight of our station here.